In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, and uh, the information I give here is pretty much uh, based off of some of the questions that I've been receiving, and so this is just my attempt to uh, answer all the questions. So I'll start off with uh, where I'm from. Uh, I'm Canadian, and I'm originally from an uh, area uh, called Richmond Hill in uh, York Region in the Greater Toronto Area. Um, where did I go to school? So I did my undergraduate at McGill University. I got a bachelor's degree of science and I majored in physiology. My GPA was about uh, 3.7, but that was mainly helped by a few beginner language courses. Uh, for medical school, I went to Seba University School of Medicine. This is the island of Seba. It's a four-year curriculum. You spend five semesters on the island doing basic uh, science lectures. Uh, and exams, and then you spend five semesters off the island doing clinical rotations across the U.S. Just some more pictures of the island. This is a picture of the uh, medical school campus. So here you have the library. Here you have the building where the first and second year uh, lectures are done. Here is the gym. Here is the anatomy lab, the cafeteria, and a building where the third, fourth, and fifth year, or fifth, sorry, semester students uh, have their lectures. Just an image through the front gates. So one of the questions was, uh, what's my experience applying to Canadian schools? And I didn't apply to any medical schools in Canada. Um, initially, I had no intention of doing medical school. I just wanted to get my bachelor's degree, get a job, and uh, get on with my life. But uh, I wasn't really able to find a job with just a bachelor's degree, especially in my field of study. Um, the only reason I did a bachelor's degree was because I thought that was what you were supposed to do. You finish high school, you go to university, and then you get a job. That's what I thought would happen, and that's, that's not, the rea not the reality. Um, so I decided I would need more education. I applied for uh, physical therapy and occupational uh, therapy master's programs in, on, uh, in Ontario. I applied to four of them and I got rejected from all of them. And, you know, um, medical school in Canada is difficult to get into and a lot of these applicants who are, you know, very high scorers, very good students, uh, have a lot of extracurriculars and all that. When they don't get into medical school, some of the things they'll do is they'll either go to other programs to make their medical school application better or they'll go into programs like this, occupational therapy and physical therapy. So I was competing with these students and I didn't, I didn't, ultimately didn't get accepted into those programs. I looked towards other programs, um, whatever I could find, you know, a cardiac perfusion technologist program. However, that required two years of education and they only took in students uh, every other year. And I was, at that point, it was the off year. so. I would have to wait at least one year just so I could apply to that program. I applied to be an air traffic controller. Um, I applied and never heard back. I was looking into becoming an underwater welder, but that would take a two-year college course. Um, really didn't know what to do, um, but at that time I said, I'll just give the whole medicine thing a try, and I studied for the MCATs for about two weeks. Um, over the course of my uh, stay at McGill University. I heard, I heard people talking about Caribbean medical school here and there, and you know it crossed my mind. But I never really thought about it seriously. Uh, I had a close friend in university that I learned that she got accepted into Caribbean medical school, and then that made me take it a little bit more serious. But uh, I still didn't really know much about it at the time. I looked a little bit more into it, and from what I learned, there were only a couple. Um, Caribbean schools that had uh, somewhat of a good reputation for, for being, you know, a little older, a little bit more well-established, already having several um, people who have gone through the program are, and are now practicing in the U.S. Um, and those were generally uh, St. George, Ross University, and Saba University, and maybe one other. There are a couple other ones now that are attaining the simil similar amount of uh, reputation in that they're sending more people through this whole process. But you can see here, this is a map of the Caribbean, and um, pretty much all of these islands, almost all of them have a, have a medical school. 
and if they don't there's probably going to be a medical school there at some point uh, it's a very profitable business and a lot of these uh, medical schools are really owned by uh, a few companies so the first uh, medical school I applied to was St. James School of Medicine and again I, I was only two weeks into studying for my MCAT I looked online and this place didn't need the MCAT so I applied and uh, a few days later I received an email saying that I would get a phone interview that happened a few days later I got a phone interview and there was about a you know 20 minutes of interviewing and about two to three days later I was accepted they sent me an email and asked me when I wanted to start so I was pretty happy but at the same time I knew that I really didn't know much of this process at all and I didn't know much about the school at all I was pretty skeptical skeptical about this school that just you know went through this whole process in one week so I did what anyone else would do I looked through some forums online and I saw that this was one of the less well-known schools in the Caribbean and I heard you know read here and there that getting a residency could be very difficult if I went to this school whether that's true or not I don't know but uh, at that time I really took that to heart and I just passed on this school. So I did some more research and uh, I learned about some schools that were a little more long-standing, that had a little bit more of a reputation and I chose Seba at that time because it was the cheapest of all the schools and they also they also did not require an MCAT. Um, the advertised cost at that time for Seba was about eight thousand dollars per semester uh, the other more well-known schools like St. George and Ross had tuitions that were very similar to the U.S. and that would be about somewhere around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a semester. So I thought great, you know, I, I thought that was pretty reasonable, but uh, throughout my stay at Seba, every semester that I was there they slowly increased the tuition until I was paying about nineteen thousand dollars for my last semester. So that it's not true anymore, and uh, I don't know what the cost of these universities are at this time, but maybe that's something you can look into. Um, another th factor that played into me going to Seba is that I had a, um, a friend of a relative who recently finished school there and was practicing in Canada, and they... Um, I spoke with the phone, I spoke with them over the phone, and you know they kind of told me that yeah this is it's not a made-up place you're not sending your money to some guy in India who made up a fake website it's a real place and uh, if you put in the work and the time and the effort it'll get you where you want to go so that kind of settled me down a little bit and I I went through with uh, accepting uh, the offer at Seba and I I uh, went to school there I stayed a little bit skeptical about the whole thing until I actually landed on the island and saw the school myself, but uh, everything everything is legitimate there. Um, I will say that the admission standards to the Caribbean schools, at least, I don't know, I guess when I applied it was maybe six or seven years ago, maybe almost eight years, the admissions were pretty, pretty low standards. Um, these places are there to make money and if you're willing to pay the tuition you'll pretty much get in uh, I have a slide a little later on that shows the average GPAs I don't know how accurate it is but uh, one of my close friends who uh, got into one of these schools had a GPA of you know a little under three and they got in so these it's not hard to get into these schools if if you're willing to pay the money more or less they'll take you so another question I got was uh, how and why did I decide to apply to a Caribbean school instead of a US school and uh, for me at the time when I decided to go through with medical school the Caribbean schools were just the most available choice um, they do something called rolling admissions which means that they take in applications and they give out acceptances all over about the course of a week and they do this throughout the year and you can pick from three different start points uh, in the year so it's like September January and then I think July is when you can start. Um, if I were to do this through the Canadian uh, or US medical school route, you know the process just to write the MCAT would take me a few weeks or months to study for it, write it and then receive my um, grades and then also the whole month, several month long process of actually 
applying to schools and interviewing and waiting for the acceptance. And I had an, uh, an acceptance offer to go to one school in my hand and I could take that or I could put in, you know, a, we a year or more worth of uh, work and time to maybe get into a different medical school. And I said, uh, I'd rather just take the offer now and uh, it'll get me where I want to go. You know, it's like the saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush or something like that. Maybe, maybe I butchered that, I don't know, but. So he, here's that slide on the average um, scores that uh, um, people who applied to these schools uh, got. Again, these are just averages and I don't know, this is from this is from 2014. I don't know how it's changed now, but you know, none of these scores are stellar. And again, these are averages, so I'm sure there are a couple 2.5s that got in as well. Um, again, it's really if you're willing to pay, you can probably get into these schools. Another question I got was: Is it easier to get into a U.S. medical school versus a Canadian medical school? Unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. I didn't apply to either of them. I didn't go through the process, so I, I can't really give any information to that. Um, somebody asked me about my perspective on other foreign medical schools. They're, they're all really the same. I mean, it's just a, a means to an end. Uh, if it gets you where you need to go, then, then it works. Uh, if it satisfies other things that you're looking for, like cost or location or or any kind of language barriers, then then it works. Um, what I will say is that to get a residency position and ultimately work in the US, you need to become ECFMG certified. The ECFMG is like this uh, overarching body that um, makes sure that all these people who are internationally educated are actually um, legitimate. And so if you go on their website and I put in a this is like a screenshot of their website. Um, they tell you what degrees are valid from their point of view and what countries these degrees have come from. Um, you know, I only know my experience from going through the Caribbean, but I have crossed paths with other people who have done medical school and have um, transitioned to American residencies. And they did their medical school in Australia, in Ireland, in Poland. Um, so you can really do it anywhere, but you just need to make sure that the ECFMG, um, it's okay by them. And here's just an example of, if you scroll down this page, they go by uh, each country alphabetically. And we go to the S and you can see SABA here and the required credential is a Master of Science in Medicine. And that, that's the diploma I got and that's equivalent to the American um, Doctorate Medicine. Another thing that you should check, so as the ECFMG, you should also look at the WHO or the World Health Organization, World Directory of Medical Schools. And you can search any country and um, it'll tell you all the, li the entire list of medical schools that per them are, for lack of a better understanding for myself, are, are legitimate medical schools. So you should make sure that you're, the school you're interested uh, you're interested in is accredited by the WHO and also by the ECFMG. That, that's really the most basic requirement that I can think of. So somebody else asked, was, uh, was Caribbean school hard? Um, you know, it's probably the same as anywhere else in terms of what's covered. It's medical school is difficult uh, no matter where you go. Uh, the main difference is really the setting and other school specific issues. Um, again, with Caribbean schools, they, they do these rolling admissions. So depending on where you start, you may have to really squeeze your schedule in order to graduate on time. This is not something they made clear to us when we first you know, signed up for this. This is something that they only told us a few semesters in, which a lot of people were upset with. But this is because the curriculum is 10 semesters uh, over four years. However, you do five semesters on the island and then five semesters doing clinical rotations. So halfway through after completing the basic sciences, you need to write a literature review paper. 
you need to study for and write your USMLE Step 1 exam, and you need to receive your Step 1 score, and then you can begin applying to clinical rotations. So that all that can take a few weeks, maybe two, three months, and that kind of eats away into your um, four-year period of when you're supposed to complete your degree. So it takes time, and you kind of have to play catch-up with your rotations if you want to graduate on time. Only a few people in my class, myself included, were able to were able to pull this off. The rest, um, they would they fulfilled their graduation requirements about one month later than us, but that was one month too late to actually graduate in the same year as us. So they could only apply for residency or or start their residency position one year after we did, even though we started in the same time. Um, another factor is because we had to compress our clinical rotations and make them very close together, it also means that we had a very difficult time making it to all our interviews. You have to understand that you do these interviews during your clinical rotations, usually, and a lot of the time these clinical rotations, um, some are more lenient and they'll allow you to take time off to go to your interviews, some are not, especially if you're taking a lot of time off and especially if it's a more important clinical rotation like a um, sub-intern rotation or something like that. So it can become very difficult and very annoying, but there's nothing you can really do about it. So people ask me about my exam scores and that's a really important factor as to uh, getting the residency you want. We're gonna go through a lot of graphs here and these graphs are all from the uh, national I think it's the NRMP, it's like the National Registry of Match something. But these are basically the people who, um, this is the organization that does the, the match. These are the people that you submit your um, ranking list to. These are the people that link the um, applicants to the programs. These are the people that, over, that, that cover that. So in this graph, what you can see here is, you know, we're over here and the total number of applicants compared to the total amount of available positions, it's almost uh, twice. So something that you might hear a lot, especially if you go to an international medical school or you're a foreign medical graduate, is that only 50% of you are going to match into residency. Now, that's a true statement, but the people who tend not to match are usually those that either English is not their first language or that they're in a very remote place compared to America. For example, you know, they're in China or India, and they're either physically not able to come to the U.S. and stay for a long enough amount of time to get a sufficient, enough, uh, sufficient number of interviews. So it's true that only about 50% of international medical graduates will match, but that's not really the case for, um, you know, people who English is their first language. This is just another graph showing the same thing. Uh, you know, foreign trained physicians made up about 50% of the applications. However, of those that matched, the foreign trained physicians made up about 25%. So it's the same thing, about 50% who apply actually match. The actual statistic, at least for Caribbean schools, was more like 90 plus percent, because again, we were generally from America, from the US or from Canada, English was our first language for everyone, so uh, we generally had a very high match rate. Now, even though you know this graph shows that there's only a limited amount of positions, every year during the match, there are several, there's a decent number of positions in nearly every specialty that goes unmatched. I'm sorry if this doesn't show up very well, but for example, I'm going to use diagnostic radiology as an example throughout these just because that's what I know the best. I think here, if I read it earlier, there are about 22 unmatched positions. Um, so again, limited positions, but almost every year in nearly every specialty, there are a few positions that go unmatched and they are attainable if you go after them. This graph just shows, again, sorry for the quality, it didn't come out as I wanted, but it pretty much shows that as an independent applicant or as a foreign medical graduate, those who matched 
about 70 percent uh, get their first or second rank so those who match tend to do well and again here's uh, all applicants so a good portion of us don't match but those that do we tend to get our first or second ranked uh, programs again so there's something called the soap so after the initial match process ends the soap is where all the uh, un unfilled positions are offered and so you can see here in 2017 almost 1200 positions went unfilled and they were offered through this secondary matching process nearly 1100 of the offers were accepted so even with this secondary match process there were still a few uh, programs or spots that went unfilled we'll just talk about scores briefly here we'll, we'll touch upon it again a little later on but just to give you an idea these are the average um, USMLE step scores for these years the step one is the most important probably the most important exam in your life because this is going to determine this is what the residency programs really look at they also look at your step two exams but really it's it's the step one exam and the step three exam is typically something you write during your first year of residency so step one you really want to do your best to get the best score possible a couple of slides here we're not really going to spend too much time on these this is more so just for your um, curiosity your interest so these are U.S. allopathic seniors. These are U.S. citizens who studied at U.S. schools, and this is for all specialties combined. You can see their average step one score, um, their contiguous ranks, and we'll touch upon that a little later on as well, and some other statistics. Uh, again, we're not going to stay here too long, but this just shows the range of step one scores for those who matched and those who didn't match across specialties, and again, this is for American citizens who went to U.S. schools. Uh, this is the same thing, Americans and American schools, but this is for radiology. This is same thing. This is radiology uh, matches depending on score. So obviously you can see that the higher the score, the more likely these people are to get a match. And this is the same information, just in a different format. You can see that you know once you get into the 240 to 250 range, you're almost guaranteed to match into radiology if you um, if you ranked it if that's what you desired. So contiguous ranks, this is uh, pretty important um, to know. So basically, a contiguous rank is you have a rank list, and after you after you interview with all the programs that you will interview with, you submit a ranking list, and you say you know I want you know these 10 programs in this order so a contiguous rank means that you rank let's again we'll use radiology as, as an example you ranked radiology programs as one two three four five then you rank the psychiatry program as six and then you ranked another radiology program as seven that means you have radiology ranked as five contiguous ranks and so here there's not much of a difference but we'll see later on that the more radiology programs or specialty program of your interest that you rank contiguously the more the higher the chance that you're going to get that um, program and we'll we'll see a slide that demonstrates that a little bit better and again this is just showing this graph in a different format and you can see as you rank the program the same program um, as you rank more of the same program you're more likely to get it so much so that you know once you have let's say 10 radiology programs in a row you're almost guaranteed to match into radiology so this is again some more information but now this is uh, concerning international medical graduates and so we're not really going to go over this this is if you just want to pause it and are curious or have a number that you're interested in and again we're not really going to go over this just comparison of average uh, step one scores and again I just use diagnostic radiology as an example the blue is those that matched and the green is those that did not match so you can see that the typical average uh, score for a for someone who matched into diagnostic radiology 
almost regardless of who they are. Again, American at an American school, American at a foreign school, or foreigner from a foreign school. It was almost always 230 to 250. 230 to 250 and 230 to 250. This is just uh, foreign medical graduates who applied to radiology against more information. So here we can see this, this uh, importance of contiguous ranking a little bit better. Here we can see that as you rank radiology, more uh, radiology programs as the top choices, you're more likely to get that choice. And again, just shown in a slightly different format, same thing. The more programs, radiology programs, that you rank uh, contiguously, the more likely you are to match, so much so that if we were to, here, if you ranked 15 programs as your top uh, choices, you're almost guaranteed to match into radiology. And uh, similar, similar idea, but this is just based off of scores. And this is really not turning out as clear as I wanted it to, but these are, I believe here it says from 2016 to 2018, your, what your score means. So for me, I scored up here between 265 and 270, and that uh, correlates to a 99th to 100th percentile. And that puts me over here. I'm a non-American international medical graduate, so that put me at a 70% chance of matching into radiology just by my score. And my contiguous ranks, I put about 12 programs, 12 radiology programs I ranked in a row. So that put me up at about 80%. So that's where I was sitting in terms of my likelihood of, of actually matching into radiology. So another question that I was asked was uh, the pros and cons of going to a Caribbean medical school. So this kind of just depends where you go. Uh, Ceiba is a small island and there really wasn't much to do except for study. There were a couple nice hiking trails, but other than that, um, nothing really to do. And I guess that's a pro because you just sit at home and study most of the time. Um, it is not the most well-developed place. Uh, they have pretty much a single road that goes across the entire island. Um, very limited grocery store options. There's only really one or two grocery stores and um, the groceries will come in on a weekly basis on a ferry and if there's some kind of weather issue or the ferry can't make it, then you have a very limited uh, choice at the grocery store for about a week. So, like I said before, um, I can't speak for all Caribbean schools, but at the time when I was at Seba, again, those timing issues, having to squeeze everything together uh, was pretty annoying um, because you're going to be a foreigner going to the U.S. as a Canadian. There's visa paperwork. There's just the fact that you're an immigrant. You have to have all kinds of papers with you. I still have to go through... If I decide to stay in the U.S., I need to you know, start speaking with an immigration lawyer and go through all that. Um, because I'm from Canada and from Ontario specifically, in order for me to uh, do a residency training program in the U.S., I have to be uh, sponsored, so not exactly sponsored, but I have to um, so sort of be allowed by Health Canada and specifically Ontario to do this so much so that I had to sign a contract saying that I would, after completing my training, I would return to Ontario and work in an underserviced area for five years. And, you know, all, all, these, all these things that you have to go through, it, it can be really, it can be a, a huge headache. Another issue is that um, for our uh, clinical rotations, in our third year, of medical school or our first year of clinical rotations, we have a couple core rotations that everyone has to go through and there are a few hospitals where these are done. And generally speaking, this is taken care of for you by the hospital, by the school administration. In your fourth year, they kind of just 
throw you out there and leave things up to you. They, they send you a document saying this is where students have done rotations and it's up to you to contact the hospital and organize everything yourself. Uh, if you go to an Amer if you are an American and go to an American school or a Canadian and go to a Canadian medical school, that doesn't happen. You have everything pretty much um, prepared for you. For us, we had to really do everything ourselves, especially in that fourth year. For my clinical rotations, you know, I was I was moving around the Northeast U.S. every few months for two years. I lived in Baltimore for a while. I lived in Brooklyn. Um, I lived in Connecticut and Ohio for a little bit. I was pretty much living out of a luggage bag for two years, and it wasn't the most enjoyable process. Uh, another question I got was, does doing school in the Caribbean make it harder to get residency in Canada? So uh, there are two, we'll go, never mind, I'll, I'll skip this part for now, but the answer is more or less yes, and that's because of the restrictive schedule you have, like I described um, before. So to, while you're doing a U.S. medical school, you should be writing your USMLE exams. Um, if you want to do a Canadian residency, you also have to take your Canadian licensing exams. So you have to take two sets of licensing exams. You need to study for both of them, and they're done a little bit differently. And you need to pay for both of them, and you need to take the time off of your clinical rotations to write both of them. So it, it does make it a little bit more difficult, and um, I, I did not write my Canadian equivalent exams because I just didn't have the time and I didn't want to but I found that those who wanted to go back to Canada were able to do so a good number of them were able to do so another question I got was was it hard to get a US residency it's not that hard it's just that it takes more effort it takes more time and it takes more money but it's it's very doable um, as a foreign medical graduate um, we are told by at least I was told by my medical school, and it seems like the um, this was pretty common throughout other uh, Caribbean medical schools as I spoke with other people, um, is that we're encouraged to apply to approximately 300 to 400 different residency programs across the U.S. Um, now, for reference, a American who is studying at a U.S. medical school, they they tend to apply to, you know, maybe five, 10, maybe 15 programs in their local area. When, when I would tell American students uh, that, you know, we would apply to several hundred programs, you know, it just, they were, they were shocked. Um, but uh, that's what, this is how you, you know, maximize your odds. Um, and, and these applications aren't free. You know, the application can cost anywhere from five to $10,000, depending on how many programs you're applying to. You also have to send lots of emails, you know, asking if there are any spots open. You have to contact programs, make sure that they got your CV. There's the time that goes into an interview. There's the expenses, um, you know, and again, this is all during your clinical rotations, if you're on a clinical rotation at that time. So it can be very difficult to make it to all your interviews. But overall, throughout this whole thing, I'd say that the most important factors to uh, getting a U.S. residency spot, you need to get a, you should get a good score, send out lots of applications, and rank lots of programs. So it's one thing to interview a place, but after you interview all these with all these programs, you're asked to give a ranking list. So if you interview with you know 40 programs then you don't have to rank all of them you can rank as many or as little as you want but it's in your best interest to rank as many as possible to maximize your odds of matching so another question I got was can you go back to Canada uh, after residency um, or sorry after medical school or residency and you know are there any restrictions so I'm really not too knowledgeable about this because I haven't really gotten to this point yet. But um, two main points when you can go back to Canada, and one is when you complete medical school and you apply for a Canadian residency, and two is when you complete residency and then you go back afterwards. Um, 
like I said before, as I'm from Ontario, so I had to sign a return of service agreement saying that I needed to work in an underserviced area for five years. Uh, I have heard here and there that there are ways of getting around this if you you know stay and work in the U.S. Um, but again, I'm not really sure. If you do return to Canada and you don't want to work in an underserviced area in the middle of nowhere, then I think there is also the option of buying out your contract, but that can be um, pretty expensive. Since these questions kind of brought up the fact to me that I don't know much about this, I have sent out a few emails and hopefully I'll know more about this soon. So some other uh, random questions I got. Uh, do you need to be good at physics to do radiology? And the answer is no. Um, physics is a big part of radiology, but our job is really to be able to read the images and troubleshoot basic stuff. For us, it's we need to know if an image is subpar in quality and maybe think of a way to fix it. Um, but that's about it. Usually there are trained physicists and technologists and other people who actually take care of the hardware part of it. Um, that being said, part of our board certification examination is a good sized physics portion and in some residency programs they offer or they have a physics curriculum and so they teach you all the physics you need to know for the exam. Um, some don't and you have to learn that on your own which can be a little bit difficult but you don't need to be like a mathematician or someone who's good at equations or anything like that. Generally speaking it's more so um, physics concepts. Uh, another question that I realize these are numbered incorrectly, but we'll just go we'll just go with it. Uh, do you feel tired after work? So it really depends on the day. A usual shift for me is around nine hours, and if it's a I mean if it's a busy day and I'm reading exams the entire day, then yep that can get a little bit tiring. But some days um, in some on some different services the uh, workflow is a little bit slower and it's really not too bad at all. Sometimes we have um, call shifts or weekend shifts and those can be up to 15 hours long and we can be you know reading and you know mentally working throughout that entire shift and that can be pretty exhausting. Uh, sometimes we have overnight shifts that are very slow and it's just tiring because it's overnight and it's um, it messes with your sleeping schedule. So somebody else asked, how much patient interaction do you have? <clears throat> it's pretty limited. We do have a few services where you work with patients. For example, the interventional radiology service or the fluoroscopy service. Those are, you know, you go in and you, you speak with the patient just briefly and then you do the procedure. Um, so there is that little bit, but otherwise, it's pretty much sitting in a cubicle at a computer desk and going through some medical and going through medical images. So another question I had was uh, tips on writing personal statements. So I, I'm sure everyone is aware of a very generic personal statement saying that you know I've wanted to do this forever and so on and so forth and that's it's it's like a big nothing burger. It, it really doesn't help anyone or say anything. Um, another common thing is, you know, volunteering at a hospital or whatever other charitable thing. It really doesn't help your application if it's just some generic volunteering. My, uh, these are my personal opinions, um, but I think you should spend your time on something that either makes you money or actually helps you in some other way, like you learn something or you make very good connections or, or whatever it is. There have been countless people, you know, pre-med on the medical medicine path who have done, you know, a thousand plus hours of volunteering at whatever hospital and the only recognition, the only, the only thing they got out of that was some letter from some random person that nobody knows that says that they were, that they were there at this point in time and that's about it really not helpful at all. You have to 
get in the mind of the applicant uh, interviewers. You know, they read hundreds of these a day, or uh, not a day, but hundreds of these over the course of a of um, interview season. Your application should be short. It should be to the point. If you don't have much to talk about, then that's fine. You know, you still have some chance of getting into competitive school. Not everyone is some kind of superstar. Um, if you really are planning things out in the long run, then you should start from, you know, when you start your undergraduate or maybe even into high school. Um, let's say, for example, if you start at the beginning of your undergraduate uh, school, and uh, you know, this has been a while for me, but I think you usually apply, you know, around your third year. You can, if you could dedicate one semester, uh, a single project to one semester, just for the purpose of making your CV or your personal statement look awesome, then I think that's very doable. You know, if you have four months to just get one project done, and it doesn't have to be a huge project. For example, um, you know, if you organized a blood drive, there are routine blood donation shortages. Um, if you can show or write some, you know, very short report that you saw the need and that you communicated with the Red Cross and local hospitals <coughs> and organized blood drives and got your school involved and brought a few hundred new donors into the donor pool and uh, you learned a lot about blood donation and made good connections and, you know, so on and so forth. That's just one project and that would, you know, that is a lot more than probably most applicants have to write about. And, you know, all that might seem like a lot. It might seem like a really big project, but really, you're sending out a few emails. You know, if you just go to your school sports team to be at these and ask them to be at these donations, you know, kind of sell it as a nice place to socialize. You know, I'm sure there are people that would come and give blood just to hang out with the guys' basketball team or the girls' volleyball team. Um, you know, you just work with the Red Cross and organize a time and location. It's not too much. And you could even split the workload with, I don't know, three, four, five different people. And you could all agree to claim complete credit for the project as long as you didn't apply to the same place and document the same that, you know, you were the lead on all of it. Um, and, you know, if you did this kind of thing once, then it'd be very easy to make it a recurring thing. And, you know, after one year, you could just keep on going with it, but then hand off the reins to someone a year under you and then do the same thing. You could say, you know, let's, um, we'll share the workload, but if we use this to apply to a medical school, then, you know, we'll, uh, we're both okay for um, claiming complete credit for the project. I think, you know, just a little bit of creativity and a little bit of resourcefulness, it can go a long way. And again, it's just one project over one or two semesters, you know, four to eight months, I think it's very doable and it would really stand out on an application. Again, you don't need to be a child prodigy. Most people really don't have much to write about, and, and that's fine. You just need to try to show some individuality, and you know it's okay to make a few things up as long as you, as long as it's something you can't really get caught lying about. Um, but just try to stay away from the generic personal statement, and just include something that's a little more specific and a little bit, a little bit more uh, individual to you, if possible. If not, it's not the worst scenario. It's just one part of the application. But uh, hopefully you'll find something that works for you. So that's going to be the end of this video. Um, hopefully I've answered most of people's questions. If there's anything else people want to know more about or any other questions that they have, they can just leave it in the comments below and uh, I'll try to get to it. Uh, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more, then subscribe to the channel. Thanks.